everyone. Glad you made it back uh, to us this week. And if this is your first time joining us, uh, what took you so long? Glad to have you here, though. Uh, I'm Scott Bootlayer, Academy Instructor uh, out here at the Wiesman office in Langley, British Columbia, Canada. And today I'm happy to, to be uh, bringing uh, the final uh, portion of this three-part solar uh, thermal technical training series uh, to you. So this is going to basically round off uh, three weeks of uh, solar training that we've been putting online here for you folks. Uh, the first uh, two, uh, of course, or the previous weeks that we've uh, that we've done this, and those will be archived for you. So if you haven't taken those ones in, you can certainly um, have a look at those. They'll be on our YouTube channel if they're not already up there. Uh, and this will basically complete that um, that series uh, for you. There's also a uh, presentation I did back in the fall on uh, ThermProtect. So it's, uh, it just talks about our uh, 200 FM collector, which we talk about throughout the series, uh, but just talking about the advantages of that ThermProtect, a little bit more deeper dive into what that's all about. So if that interests you, uh, you can have a look at that. That's available on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, today, joining me uh, from our North America headquarters in Waterloo, Ontario, uh, always happy to have Mark Norris uh, join me. He's, uh, he is virtually beside me here. Uh, only 5,000 kilometers, I guess, away. Uh, good morning, Mark. Good morning. How are you? Or good afternoon, I guess. I'm doing well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah The uh, just to, to your point of earlier about the videos, the, the videos of part one and part two are up on the YouTube channel now. Oh, excellent. That's good to know. So that's, uh, so this, like I say, we'll we get the trifecta here of uh, solar presentations and we finish this one and, and log this one as well. Uh, you also have uh, somebody beside you, I think, uh, a little closer, still uh, still safely distancing. Right. Uh, we managed to coax uh, Steve Royce, our, uh, our head solar uh, guru out of our uh, head office there, uh, against his better judgment to join us. Uh, I'm not sure why against his better judgment, because Mark and I have some pretty high standards when we put these things on. So I think he would have been happy to join us. But he's beside, he's, uh, uh, I think, how do you guys have it arranged, Mark? He's going to look after the Q&As today or? Yeah, we might as well let him do all the work and I'll just sit back now. Because, because like, you know, <laughs> when the chef's in the kitchen, you don't let the, you don't let the sous chef cook, right? That's right. Still need a taste tester though, right? That's right. So, That's right. I'll, yeah. I'll do all the so, tasting. Yeah. So he's going to be, uh, he might be the mediator if uh, Steve and I start getting into it on the solar stuff. So we, we affectionately call uh, uh, Steve Royce uh, Solar Steve. Uh, uh, that's his, uh, that's his name, or, uh, I think sunshine's another one that he comes, that he has. So feel free to, to, uh, basically, um, introduce yourself to him, uh, through the Q and a, uh, if you have any questions there, but what else are we up to today? That's about it. Just you and him and me. Okay. Let's, let's let this thing go in man. So what are we doing? We're going to, we're going to talk about today starting up, uh, the system. So start up and commissioning, I think Steve uh, basically, hello. yep. Yeah. What's that? I think Steve should say hello. Oh, well, come on. Come on, Steve. Say hello, man. Hello, everybody, and welcome oh, there to the Feastman there he is. Solar so Training just, Session number three. Yeah, we just so didn't we, want to think that we were sure still there and not sleeping. <laughs> exactly. We wanted to make sure people actually knew that there was a third person. We're, yeah, we're just we, talking we, about this we, virtual we, Solar yeah, Steve. Yeah. yeah. That's a figment of our imagination. Yes. So we're glad to have you, Steve. Uh, welcome. And uh, like I say, uh, thank you for looking after the Q&A and the, and the chats and stuff like that for us today. And uh, Steve will be hanging with us the whole presentation, hopefully. He doesn't fall off his desk. And uh, he's going to uh, be at the end there. So if you have any questions, uh, we'll, uh, we'll open it up uh, and uh, we'll see, um, get those answers to you guys at that point in time. But we're going to um, move through uh, the presentation here today, just kind of, it's going to be a culmination of the of the previous uh, presentations, putting all that information that we've got from that uh, into that final product. So what we're going to be looking at basically is this, what you see on the screen is a properly operating uh, closed loop 
hydronic solar thermal system. So that was a lot of uh, detail there to bite off, but that's what we're kind of looking at here is integration of all of the things we talked about. We're gonna go through that here a little bit, um, but basically the idea is a successful uh, solar thermal installation that's gonna last uh, you know, 25 plus years out there uh, in the field and given the, uh, the owner, uh, some free energy there and basically that a good return on his investment. So the, there's a lot to getting to this particular point. So it's very methodical. There's a lot of steps there. You don't want to skip steps. And just like anything, it really comes from careful planning. So it, it comes from, uh, you know, those initial site visits, uh, sizing up your system, uh, putting all those components together correctly, uh, doing the proper commission as we're going to talk about today, and then also after it's commissioned, uh, correct maintenance, you know, making sure that the system is in good working order uh, for those 25 plus years. So we're going to move through a little bit of what we talked about already. Uh, this was the first week we talked about the, you know, collectors uh, and of course, uh, you know, how to uh, get those collectors fixed in the proper uh, orientation to the sun, uh, what angle we want to fix them at. Uh, Viesman makes uh, a basically a, a kind of a plug and play uh, uh, system here for collector uh, installation. So whether it's on walls or slope roofs or flat roofs or ground mounting, uh, we have the fixing uh, kits there, the installation components to put that system together, as you can see on here, just a kind of a little brief uh, look at a, a few different applications there that uh, kind of put that into context, as well as all of the little fixing pieces, components to, you know, to fix the racking and the collectors together. Uh, some of the things we're going to talk about here today as well, uh, you know, air vents and uh, sensor well sets, so all those things make a complete system. And to short, you know, short uh, change on one of those uh, could be a problem uh, down the road. We're going to look at how we use all these things to make that system work and operate and function correctly. So when you do buy a system from Wiesman um, that's dimensioned correctly, you'll get all of the fixing uh, pieces to put that together uh, so that uh, the idea there is there's no cutting and, and you know, uh, soldering and splicing and stuff like that up on the roof. It's all dimensioned uh, already ahead. It's already pre-engineered and that is ready to go uh, for you as a system. So basically it, it shows up on the site, you just put those pieces together. Last week we talked about uh, basically dimensioning the things you see on the screen right here. So we start off at the top here with the collector, you know, depending on what the application is, dimensioning of those collectors, you know, how many we're going to put on the, on the roof and directly related to that, whether it's a tank or a pool, uh, whether it's the tank is for space heating or for domestic hot water applications, we learned uh, some good rules of thumb about how, you know, what the size of that tank for storage needs to be in comparison to the dimensioning of the collectors up on the roof. Uh, so some good information there to make sure that we've carefully sized and engineered that system. We've also looked at, you have to trust me, there's a pump in behind the, uh, this, uh, this little divicon here, how to size that circulator for proper flow rate the dimensioning of the piping here, uh, how much fluid we're gonna need to fill the system as a result of the size of the piping that we have here, uh, how to basically pressurize the system, including the uh, expansion tank size, as well as uh, what type of pressure we wanna hold it at. So a lot of information there that you would need to know uh, in order to properly commission the system. If you don't know any of that, uh, how we got we came to any of that it's going to be difficult for you to properly uh, commission a system um, without that critical bits of information today we're going to take that uh, information that we we came upon last week and we're going to put it into practice here so we're going to look at other components that you're going to want to have in your system to properly uh, start it up and commission it so things like isolation valves uh, thermometers pressure gauges uh, purge tees flow meters uh, there's a, a bunch of different things. We're going to have like air separators. So there's a lot of things that if you don't have something like this, your system, this is called a Divicon. We make a couple of different sizes. You're going to see uh, those components are going to have to be part of this system to make sure that we can adequately uh, commission it and make sure it's going to be reliable in operation. As well as that, we're going to look at the solar uh, control as well. How are we going to control this system? We, uh, we need some inputs, so we need some uh, feedback to the control. It's going to basically uh, have an output to pumps or valves that we have in the system. And we want to properly uh, program that 
system to optimize the performance of that solar thermal system once you have it up and running. So we're going to look at some kind of some generic things you want to see in your controls, specific, obviously, the controls that we work with here at Wiesman. But you may be dealing with, uh, you know, controls, you maybe it's a, a BMS system that you're, you're programming, some of the functions you want to have in your controls to make sure that you have a successful system. I've seen lots of different ways or methods people try to come up with to properly control the system it really should just come down to a couple of temperature uh, comparisons and some differential settings and real you know keep it simple on that side of it uh, and uh, you'll have a much better success uh, as far as the overall operation performance so we'll kind of look at how uh, you know the kind of the easiest ways to kind of get this system up and running uh, and the proper things you want to look for in that control so we're gonna start off with that, that commissioning. We've already come up to this point. If you joined us last week, this little yellow sticker comes with the installation package. And the whole idea is this is a reference of the startup for future uh, service and maintenance uh, uh, visits as well. Uh, in this document that's gonna be, basically it's a sticker that you can stick on the expansion tank or somewhere near that system. We're gonna detail uh, the uh, what we've, what we, essentially started the system up with. The pressures in the collectors, the pressures uh, in the expansion tanks, the overall um, static pressure, cold fill pressure of the system is all documented here so that I can compare that, you know, three or four years down the road to make sure that that system is in still, you know, proper uh, functioning order, right? There should be a whole lot of changes between startup, you know, and three or four years down the road as to what we see there for pressures. Remembering with our collector, so the Therm Protect uh, absorber coating we have in the 200 FM collectors we talk about, uh, there's a maximum limitation of the temperature on those collectors. It basically will emit radiation from about 167 degrees Fahrenheit and essentially become an emitter at about 145 C. So they'll hold 145 C, but they won't go any higher than that as far as the temperature. They just continually uh, dump that heat. So it's a kind of a natural heat dissipation. Uh, if we hold the pressure in our therm protect systems where the collectors are sitting at about 44 pounds, uh, they're above the boiling point or vapor point pressure point of the glycol, which means that there's not going to be any stagnation or boiling off, I should say, steam formation in the collectors when we get into periods of stagnation or lack of load where the collectors are still gathering that, uh, that radiation. So just some information there. And you'll see that here on our little sticker. So filling it out from last week, April 20th, when we did this, we set the collector pressure at 44 pounds to, to, to make sure we don't have any steam formation. And then based on the height here, 60 feet of piping between the top of the collectors and our pressure gauge, we have so many, you know, 0.45 uh, pounds per foot. And multiply that, we get 27 pounds. Add those two together, we get 71 PSI now uh, as far as cold fill pressure in our system. Uh, and that's gonna be documented stuck right there so a guy can walk in there and compare that to what the actual pressure is to see if there's any issues. Uh, and then we also have, so that's what we're gonna see on our pressure gauge, what we should see. And then the expansion tank pressure is adjusted to 67 and a half pounds. So you'd have to isolate the expansion tank, take the bleed, the pressure off here and take a measurement to, to verify that it's still holding at 67 and a half pounds. There might be some other things that you would come across that would indicate that there might be some differences there. If you say the uh, relief valve popped or something, we might have to have a look at that uh, as a maintenance thing. We'll look at that uh, a little bit uh, ahead here, getting ahead of myself a bit. So this stuff is there. Uh, for uh, not only just to give you some information as far as how we're going to start this up and commission it, but also, as I say, down the road when we need to have those uh, bits of information just for reference points uh, to make sure everything's running properly. Uh, the Divicon, as I mentioned, we have two different sizes and we use these to sell these with the systems. Uh, and uh, they basically come with all the components that you would need to, to get the system started up and running. So you've got your, th your temperature gauges for supply and return back. So you can see your Delta T's. You've got a pressure gauge here, which is important obviously for what we're talking about here, getting that fill pressure up and all that. Our relief valve, we've got purge T's here. So isolation valves here we can use for, for pressurizing the system, getting it up and running, getting the air out of it. Uh, there's also, uh, as we see, there's gonna be an air separator in here. Your pump is in here. Uh, there are some check valves as well for so that we don't have any reverse uh, uh, cooling of the uh, of the system uh, as the uh, during the evening or whatever we have heat maybe coming out of the tank and moving up through the collectors. 
that's mitigated by check valves in the uh, in the uh, Divicon itself here to stop that from occurring. So lots of uh, good bits of, of uh, components there that you would need in a system to start it up. So it just puts it in a very compact type of, of uh, component here that you can install in your system. Uh, so these are the steps that you're going to have to take uh, to get your system started. And uh, we're gonna kind of go through this and then I'm gonna show you the steps that we haven't already uh, moved through last week. So we went through this critical phase last week, how to size or basically check and adjust that expansion tank pressure before we basically uh, add it into the system. Uh, we also want to, uh, just like any boiler, any boiler system, you know, if you're cutting pipe and there's oils and different contaminations on the piping, you want to flush that piping out before you, you put your fluid in there because you don't want any of that contamination of those oils, et cetera, kind of fouling up your system. So there'd be a cleaning of the and flushing of the system there. And then we would start with the commissioning or getting the fluid, uh, that our solar fluid into that uh, piping connection there. We're gonna show you how that gets done in the next slide. So step three here is where we're gonna start off with the next slide, charging the system with the solar fluid. And again, if it's a, uh, because it's in our list here, uh, if you're using Typhicor, the Typhicor we sell is already pre-mixed. You don't have to add any water to it. Uh, if you do add water to, to glycol, generally speaking, uh, distilled water is preferable uh, because there's no additives in the distilled water to basically uh, mix with the inhibitors in the glycol to, to cause any issues. So just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind there if you're adding water to glycol. Uh, then we set that, remember that, that final fill pressure. I'm going to explain how we do that as well. Uh, we're going to do that as we're charging the system with our charge cart. Uh, once we get the system uh, finally filled up and got that pressure set, then we're going to purge the air out of it. And that's kind of an ongoing thing, especially the first year of the life of that, that system. We want to get as much air out as possible, just like a regular um, hydronic closed loop system, you know, heating a building, for instance, uh, air. Uh, it can be a, a real, uh, basically, uh, inhibitor to proper performance. We want to make sure that it's uh, not in there uh, bothering the system as far as operation. Once we get the system uh, flow rate set up here, again, that's going to be part of this uh, purging and setting up the flow rates. Uh, we put a little uh, anything, basically, we don't want to have the relief valve here piped to a drain. Uh, we don't want that glycol going down the, the drain. We want to we want to know if the relief valve here is released. So generally what we do is we take the container, I mentioned this last week, uh, that the Typhor comes in and we use that uh, as the uh, as the uh, blowdown container here, basically the relief valve container. So if any, any if the relief valve does release, we'll be able to see it actually in the tank and that will give us evidence that we had uh, an event there where that relief valve popped. And that might basically at that point, we might want to look at, you know, system adjustments here to see if, if we... Uh, can mitigate that issue in the future. Uh, we set up the controls, which we're going to do as well. And then we take the cover off of the panels. If it's a, a, an evacuated tube system, at that point, you would install the tubes. We're not going to have the panels uncovered and, the, and or tubes installed. We're basically not going to have heat exchange of the collectors to our system when we haven't had it properly set up yet. So the whole idea is all this stuff is done first. And then you add the surface that's going to absorb the energy uh, so we know confidently once we have all these, uh, you know, eight steps done before we have that ninth step, that that system's going to basically start right, right off uh, gathering energy and basically dumping it into the, our storage tank there. So that's the idea. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves, remove the, the, the uh, material off the collectors here first and have the sun beating down on that. It just basically makes it that much harder to commission that system with the fluid getting hotter and hotter as we're, as we're doing it. So save that for the very last once we get that system up and running. So the uh, bottom right-hand corner, you'll see the V-spin solar hand pumps we have available, and you can use that basically to manually pressurize the system. So it will, will kind of do this a similar thing where we can bump the pressure up in the system. Uh, the little pressure test pump uh, uh, from Rigid there as well gets you to the proper pressures we're looking for, some high pressures there, uh, but they don't provide velocity. And that's kind of what you're looking for when we first want to charge the system up here to get that air moving. Uh, transfer pump or something like that that you can use. Uh, Beastman used to have a solar charge cart that would uh, kind of use it, used a, a gear pump. Uh, that would basically pressurize the system, move it through. So we want to get about 1.3 feet per second of uh, velocity. That's going to get the air entrained in that solar fluid and get it back into that uh, our little our little cart here. Uh, so as we're filling the system up, of course, you're going to add more fluid to it, top it up as it starts to drain down. 
Uh, and then we're going to basically what we're looking for is a nice clear flow of fluid coming out of the return here, dumping in. We don't want to have that basically spitting air and stuff. It's we're still at that point, we're still ventilating the, uh, the, the piping. We just want to keep this running for as long as it takes for that system basically to charge up. We have a nice clean flow of fluid coming back here. So the bigger the system, obviously, the longer this is going to take. Uh, and uh, but this is the first step in to making sure we get the air out of that piping and that connection. As we are filling this system up in this, uh, with this uh, charge card, uh, as we get that fluid flowing back here nice and, and, and clearly, we can start to throttle back this valve here on the return. Basically, when we start throttling this back, of course, it's going to start to increase the pressure on our system. And we're going to want to fill that up, get that pressure up to our our. our our fill pressure that we're looking for. Remember on a little sticker, I would actually add probably another four or five pounds onto that. The reason being is that you want to el eliminate air. Uh, so you're going to have some reserve there that will allow you to basically to continually purge the air out of that system. Uh, and then of course, eventually you'll be able to basically drop it down to what your, what your final fill pressure should be. But adding a little bit of reserve there just allows for uh, elimination of air over time uh, through your system. So you get an idea how that's set up. And again, the Divicon has the purge T in it. The newer one's a bit different. The, this, uh, this supply line's up in the top here now. Same idea though, uh, basically you're purging through the collectors as you see in this kind of orientation. And once we get that pressure, you get that, va that valve uh, closed at your final fill pressure looking for, you can shut the, the transfer pump off. And at this point in time, uh, the collectors are covered, remember? So there's no sun on them yet. We're going to turn the pump on uh, here. So a lot of the controls will have, uh, you know, the solar controls have a manual pump on uh, uh, capability, relay test type of, of uh, functions. We can turn that pump on manually. And we're just going to let the system now uh, use the circulator now to, to move that fluid around the system. Any residual air now is going to move around. It's going to th go through the air vent that's still open up here. That's our fast air vent, we call it. We're going to shut that off eventually, but we're going to keep it on for this period of time as well as we can start looking at the little um, little window here for our flow uh, setters that are on the Divicons. Uh, and basically you'll be able to see air bubbles kind of moving through here to give you an idea how much air is still in the system. Uh, but you'll be able to start to set your uh, pump uh, flow rate here now uh, based on the Divicon you have. So the two div Divicons we have, one to 20 will give you up to six gallons a minute of flow. Uh, and we're up to 10 gallons a minute on the, on the DN25. So two different sizes. Uh, 10 gallons a minute is actually a pretty good uh, commercial solar thermal system. Uh, if you uh, were took in our, our seminar last week, uh, we covered a little bit about the flow rates and stuff. So it's a pretty considerably sized uh, solar thermal system at even at 10 gallons a minute. It doesn't take a whole lot of flow rate to get those uh, to, to add collectors to your system. So that's the, the idea. We're going to let that run. I usually let that run depending on the system, but that could be manually on for 30 minutes or so. And as we're letting that pump run, of course, the air is getting out of it. We're seeing less and less air bubbles traveling past the little window here. Eventually, what we're going to do is we're going to shut that uh, air vent off at the top of the collectors. So that's our final commissioning at the top. We're going to shut that valve off, close the little uh, vent at the top here. Uh, and make sure if we leave that open, what's going to happen is if the collectors get hot here, of course, you could get steam. And of course, you're going to lose pressure because that glycol is going to vaporize through the air vent. And of course, as it vaporizes, your pressure here is going to change, drop, and eventually you're going to start having issues with uh, pumping in your system and, and issues like that. So we want to close that valve off at commissioning. So as soon as we basically get to the point where we're, we're confident that we're, our air is almost gone, we can shut that off. And now we'll be working, uh, I should mention actually anything, any va um, air vents that are not exposed to potential steam, like the ones down you know, closer to the uh, tanks and stuff, you can leave those ones open uh, so that they're still doing their job automatically. Uh, if you don't have the automatic air vents in your system, uh, other than the one at the top that we've just closed off, you're going to move your air elimination now to the Divicon if you have one of these in your in your system. So you can see the importance of having some sort of air elimination device in your solar thermal system uh, for uh, evacuating that air after the fact. Uh, you have two in your pumping station. So you have this large air separator uh, vertically mounted on the left-hand side of your system. So as that heated water, so it's the hottest fluid coming into the Divicon, 
hits this area, it hits this big chamber. Of course, the velocity changes. The air bubbles are now released from that because of that velocity change. And because there's a pipe and a pipe here, the air gets kind of stuck up at the top portion. And now you use a little keyed air vent here, a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of, of, of hosing comes with the Divicon that you can connect to that, take it down to a cup and just open that up enough, uh, basically drain enough until you get a good clear flow of, of glycol and then close it up. That's why I mentioned getting a little bit more pressure in there than what you actually need because you're going to be eliminating some air as we go here and that's just going to compensate for that. Uh, we also have on the pump here, uh, it's a manually primed type of pump. So a little um, uh, port here, you can back that uh, screw off and basically you can make sure that your 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 pump uh, impeller here, all that is is uh, properly vented from air as well, uh, so that you don't have any issues with the circulator. Uh, and uh, so you can do that. And basically we would use this little air vents and of course this little key here ongoing. So the first, uh, you know, we're gonna make sure we purge air uh, for the first week of uh, the system's operation. Just check that pressure and, and make sure that uh, we're getting the air out from this little, air uh, separator on a daily basis. And all the ways up, you know, basically for the first six months, uh, you know, you're gonna wanna check that on a weekly, you know, and then, uh, you know, every uh, six months for that first year of that, uh, that system's life. Important to get the air out as we're gonna see as we, as we move through here. So once we get that air, we're uh, uh, moving through the system. Now we're looking at uh, setting up the solar control uh, so that what do you need that solar control to do? It's got to completely operate your system. So one tank, two tanks, 10 tanks, whatever it is, the control has to operate that. Uh, we're going to look at how we set this up uh, as well. So depending on the, uh, the types of controls you have, of course, the more relay output you have, the more tanks we can heat up, the more differential temperatures we can control, the more sensor inputs you have, uh, the more of those loads you can control as well, the more configurations you have available in your control. But we're also looking for what's available in your controls, or you might want to be configured these uh, into your systems if you don't have these controls, things like heat dump functions. Um, collector cooling functions and tank cooling functions, uh, communication uh, V-BICE accessories or communication accessories for these uh, race hall controls. And uh, basically, or you know, SD cards, things that you can uh, trend uh, or log into that system and watch it to see if there's any issues. It's very important to know that the system's actually operating correctly and those uh, are available there. Um, uh, in our controls, you wanna make sure that some of those functions are available in what you're utilizing as well. Uh, any inputs, basically you have sensors that you're wiring back to the control. So you could have a, you'll have a sensor in the, in the um, collectors as one of them. Usually that's the S1. And then depending on how many loads you're, you're covering. So if we're just doing a domestic hot water system, you might only have one other sensor, maybe two. Uh, if you have um, a dual load function where you have a, maybe a pool and a domestic hot water, you're going to have at least three uh, sensors, if not, if not more. So you're going to, pick the control based on how many loads you have to control, how many sensors you're gonna need and what type of system you're setting up there. Can it, can it communicate with some sort of a BMS system? Those types of things are gonna be critical questions to ask before you make that particular purchase. Also, instead of moretting uh, the wiring, especially ones that are exposed to the uh, outside, like the solar sensor, a uh, good idea to solder the wires together here and, and uh, heat shrink it as we see uh, with the tubing uh, here instead of a moret. Uh, because you're out in that atmosphere, hot and cold, you get corrosion, of course, the resistance starts to change. That's gonna throw the control off. Also be wary of the lengths, how many feet you need to go from the solar collector to your control. You may have to upsize the, the, uh, the, the dimension of the wiring here to make sure you don't add resistance to that uh, system. And adding resistance, of course, is gonna increase the temperature, which could start to change the characteristics of the control as far as its operation. So a couple of things there to consider uh, as you're installing that system, what type of, you know, what, what's the gauge of that wire? Is it, is it thick enough for what, the length that you're running it? The sensor is critical as far as location uh, in relationship to the control here. So if we were looking at, and we're a boiler manufacturer, so it kind of comes from this from a kind of a bit of an area of expertise, uh, but question, it's a bit rhetorical, uh, where would you place a boiler temperature uh, sensor to control the limits on a boiler? So if we're try, you know, having a fixed high limit, which is typical on a boiler, as well as an operating limit, you, know, you want to turn the boiler on, but only go to a certain temperature. And of course, if that, if that, uh, 
if that's if that uh, limit fails, you got the fixed limit to basically keep the blur from you know uh, uh, turning into a, a steam bomb. Uh, those sensors, where do we locate those? Are, are they in the piping somewhere? You know, down here, you know, uh, on this side or that side? Generally speaking, uh, when we have uh, operating limits on a control, they're inside of the actual pressure vessel where the heat is being generated. That is the best spot. That's the safest spot uh, for you to place your boiler control uh, sensors. The same goes for your solar. Uh, and so many times I've seen where the sensor is not located in the collector. It's downstream of the piping here somewhere. Uh, and you got to understand, of course, this collector is heating up. There is, and it's basically, you can't rely on gravity because it's typically the top, this is the highest point. I typically in your system is the collector. The heat has to conductively migrate down the pipe here now to hit a sensor that's located outside of the collector. By that time, this collector might already be in steam. So the location of the sensor, something as simple as that, uh, can make or break a solar thermal system. So it's very important that we make sure that we are inside of the collector. We're, we're measuring the hottest part of that particular collector. So our sensor well set will slide that sensor right into the top portion of the 200 FM collectors, which is the hottest part of the collector. We don't wanna have the sensor at the return. That's not gonna be uh, accurate. We want it at the hottest part, which is the top portion of that collector as the fluid goes from the bottom up to the top it heats up and this is where we're going to measure the hottest temperature uh, of that collector inside and the same goes with the uh, the other uh, sensors as well the load sensors need to basically pick up the coldest possible temperature uh, whether it's the pool or a tank that we are dumping heat into here we want to pick up the coldest possible temperature everything we deal with in solar is about differential temperatures. And in order for us to pick up this temperature, uh, it, here we are trying to heat this tank up and we got a sensor that, I don't even think this sensor is actually in this piping. It's probably in a T here somewhere. So by the time it picks up a temperature uh, that's very different in the tank here, we turn this, this uh, control on. And of course the heated fluid moves across this and probably turns it right back up again because it thinks the tank's already hot. So this sensor should be inside of this tank, not on the solar line here, picking up the temperature as we, as we move through here. So a problem uh, in a solar thermal system that you'd wanna have a look at here is the location of your sensors. They need to be inside of the, in, in a tank, the bottom portion of the tank, uh, even if it was in the tank itself here, if we had that sensor sitting in here, this little well here, Think about it, the temperature uh, has to cool now from the bottom, has to cool all the ways up to here before the solar control can pick up that that tank is cooled and it's time for us to turn that pump on because the solar collector is now hotter than, than that. So the, the idea there uh, is that we have that sensor now located at the very bottom portion of the tank. We actually make a, um, elbows for our tanks for solar thermal systems where the sensor will slide right in and it's very at the very bottom uh, of the tank here now picking up the as cold a water as we possibly can um, in that particular system. And when those uh, placement of those sensors are accurate, so if we're in the best possible spot, we're gonna optimize the control uh, on time. As far as when that control snaps on, it's gonna optimize when it happens. We've got the collector temperature up here. We've got the solar thermal at the very bottom of the tank here. And how we operate these is typically off of a differential, as I've kind of mentioned a couple of times. Uh, so differentials are programmed in. And what the differential here means is basically we turn this solar pump on. When this control measures an eight degree difference, eight degrees Celsius difference between the collector temperature, which has to be higher than the tank temperature. So as soon as that differential is met, this control says, let's turn this pump on and let's start pulling that heat and dumping it into the tank. If the collector uh, temperature difference between the tank gets down to about three degrees in this example, we're gonna, the control is gonna say the differential is now too narrow. We're gonna turn the pump off. The reason why we do that is 
a uh, three degree differential here instead of just you know one degree, which is the minimum, is the line set. So of course, if this line set is long enough here that at a you know there's a potential here that at three degrees we still pull that heat down. By the time it reaches the tank, it might be lower than the actual tank temperature. So now instead of heating the tank up we're actually pulling heat out of the tank and heating the collectors up. So that off differential is important based on, you know, your line sets, how well they're insulated and all those types of, of variables, uh, you know, in dis individual systems. The other uh, portion of this control is to operate the tank temperature here. So it's turning the pump on and off to basically deliver the heat, but what's the maximum temperature that we can dump into this particular tank? And typically we wanna harvest as much solar energy as possible uh, so most of the time, the tank temperatures are well above most of your standard type of uh, domestic hot water uh, settings. So things like 50 C or 120 Fahrenheit or 60 C 140, those are you know uh, good numbers for your your typical domestic hot water function in a building. But when we're at when we're grabbing solar, we want to make hay while the sun shines, literally. So as much energy as we can possibly stuff into this uh, battery we're gonna to wanna to jam as much of that in there. So that could mean, uh, you know, tank temperatures here that could be very different, uh, could be very uh, dangerous if they're, uh, if somebody opened up a faucet or a fixture here with that kind of temperature. Uh, typically we would recommend almost 99 to 100% of the time, recommend an anti-scald valve on your domestic hot water systems when you have solar because of the potential for this uh, temperature to be inside of this little solar tank. So when it uh, dumps in here, of course, we're protecting the occupants uh, that are gonna be opening up these fixtures from those, those temperatures um, hitting those particular fixtures. Uh, in our manual on page 87, the solar design guide, which the three presentations that we've been talking about here are all based upon, uh, have some nice drawings and information on different types of applications for those anti skull valves in your systems. Some other little note here that popped up, I, I forgot that I, I put this on this presentation, but the, the on time here, you might be playing with that, you know, eight degree C on time, that's the default. Uh, it depends on the length of piping here that you have and how well it's insulated. So maybe you might have a, a longer differential, you know, say if you had a, you know, instead of, you know, uh, 50 feet of, of uh, piping, you had a hundred feet, you might want to uh, increase that differential a little bit more. It's all about making sure that you've got usable heat coming into the tank. It's not colder than the actual tank itself. So it might be a little bit of play there on that on and off, uh, depending on your different systems that we're, we're talking about. So some of the other things that we want to look at as far as uh, control features and functions. Um, this one I mentioned uh, last week, uh, Keep it simple uh, is, is really the best approach when we first start up a system. So I like to basically uh, ensure that the system actually works. Just a straight on off uh, of the pump uh, as far as operation to make sure that the, you know, the air is eliminated and all the system uh, is functioning and operating correctly. And then you can introduce these efficiency uh, kind of gainers, things like uh, speed controls, very useful on uh, solar controls here. Uh, and our controls, you have the ability of adjusting that, that uh, minimum maximum speed. So basically what the speed control will do is it gives the pump a range. We can start off at like the 30 is the minimum and you can go all the way up to, you know, obviously 100% is the max. Uh, so you can take that minimum up a little bit or down depending on what you have available there. Uh, the notation that pump speed must be set to 100 for diverting valves isn't talking about uh, this particular arrangement where this uh, pump here, R1 has to be set at 100 because we have a diverting valve in here. What it's saying is the power for this diverting valve, uh, we would have to set that to 100% to make sure the diverting valve is getting a full uh, amount of energy or you know 120 volts to turn it on or you know flip it. If we set it to 30 and, and it would actually, you'd actually have the valve chattering here. So that's the idea behind the diverting valve set to 100%. The pumps here, any pumps, you can actually adjust that that, uh, that pump uh, speed arrangement here um, during your startup. Some other things you'd want to adjust uh, to get the speed control to operate is the delta T. So that's what the whole thing behind speed control is, is you're gonna set a delta T and through the speed control, we're gonna maintain that delta T. So in this case, it's a 20 degree Fahrenheit delta T that we've programmed. Uh, into the, the system. So once the pump turns on, it's gonna to try to target a 20 degree differential. And of course, it'll allow the system, basically the system to rise up four degrees before it starts to speed the pump up to basically narrow that delta T back down again. 
So if I didn't explain that well enough here, we're gonna have a look at how that actually works. A little animation comes up here in a moment. Um, but a couple of things, the benefits obviously, uh, you reduce the amount of uh, power uh, that the pump is gonna use, uh, as well as, let's get back there a little bit. Uh, you're gonna have a better matching of the flows. We call it a match flow type of system when we have uh, basically to maintain that Delta T. So essentially you get the, the collector up to a more usable temperature and sustainable temperature that, that pump stays running. So what happens? We get that Delta T, pump turns on to 100%. And then after about uh, a few minutes of time, uh, seconds of time, it drops down to 30%. And basically what it's trying to do now is increase that collector temperature so that we spread the delta T out to that 20 degrees that we're looking for. So it's going to basically uh, speed that pump up uh, until we start to basically get to the point where we have that 20 degree differential. If the collector basically exceeds that four degree rise, we go up to 24 degrees in this instance, it's going to start to speed the pump up by 10% increments here until we drop that delta T back down to what we're trying to achieve here, that target of 20 degrees. And of course, if the, if the temperature delta T is too narrow, it's gonna slow the pump down here, kind of the reverse uh, to the minimum of 30%. So it can only do so much depending on what the, the uh, radiation value is, uh, basically to maintain that particular delta T. So that's a match flow capability. And again, I like to test that the system uh, uh, works first and prove it before I start playing around with the flow rates like that. Uh, some other things that you can have a look at, uh, we uh, emergency collector temperature uh, off function. So basically we set a maximum temperature uh, and the reason why we would do that uh, would be to protect the components down here in the system. So any components that, uh, that may not be able to handle those high temperatures, we wanna turn that pump off. Once you're to this point, most likely you're gonna be in that stagnation um, uh, period because the pump can now no longer turn on until the collectors cool down by 20 degrees. So whatever we set this at 270, it's got to drop to 250 before this pump is able to come back on again. And of course, it's going to hold that off. So most likely at this point, you're in a stagnation uh, period. But if you have some other functions in your control capabilities, so collector cooling options here, and tank cooling options, we can start playing around with basically keeping the collectors from reaching this temperature by cycling the pump here and just jamming a little bit more energy into this tank. So we have a what we call a collector cooling option here. We can turn that on. And what you're gonna do is set a collector max. So it'll be, a, it'll be below this temperature, what that max is in order for this function to start to work. Going into stagnation here is obviously not an issue uh, if we have some function on this side of the system, we can play around here and stop the collectors from getting into stagnation. That might be enough to basically avoid having to worry about, you know, this, this event occurring. Uh, again, with our therm collect, uh, collectors, therm protect collectors, uh, that's hard to say three times fast. Uh, you keep those above 44 pounds. We don't have to worry about the steam formation uh, in there anyway. So as far as the uh, cooling functions, uh, there's three of them we're gonna talk about here. Collector cooling, nighttime cooling, and then vacation cooling. And vacation has to be turned on uh, by the uh, owner uh, when they go on vacation. But the idea of collector cooling function, just like any normal day, we heat the collectors, uh, uh, tank up to its maximum, the collector turns the pump off our, our control. If we get that max temperature in the collectors, the pump turns back on again and we dump that energy uh, into the tank here. So it goes above 160. Uh, once we drop 10 degrees, the pump shuts off. If it rises back up 10 degrees again to that max collector, it turns on again. So you see that cycling on and off to the maximum of 200 degrees in the tank. So by the time we went from 160 to 200 degrees, if that was a 40 gallon tank, that's about 13,000 more BTUs dumped in that tank. So at night, what happens in the night uh, tank cooling function is we take that excess energy, we just turn the pump on at night, and now we use the collector as a radiator, basically radiating to the atmosphere uh, to cool that tank temperature back down to its usable tank temperature again, the normal setting of that. In the vacation mode, everything happens exactly the same as what we just talked about. Uh, we, we store energy at uh, during the day at night, 
we uh, can cool the collectors back down, but in the vacation mode, instead of it coming back down to the default temperature of 160, the normal tank temperature that we hold, we can actually program a lower tank temperature. So we can actually dump it down to as low as, you know, in this instance, 80 degree Fahrenheit. So during the vacation mode, what we're doing is we're using this tank to store all the energy during the day and then dump it at night. So we basically keep the collector from going into stagnation. So those are some functions that we can use, especially with the 200 FM, all those help to, to keep those collectors in, in, you know, in real uh, safe operating conditions. And, and essentially all we're doing is, uh, not all we're doing, but the primary focus there is to protect the uh, glycol from hitting temperatures where it's gonna start to uh, disintegrate and get into, uh, into, into some problems as far as its acidity. Another function we have, so this week kind of going down towards, like I say, a lot of systems out there where the sensors are not in the right location. Uh, the collectors are overheating by the time the sensor picks up that there's, there, there's heat available. Uh, they can really uh, basically cause problems in your systems. There is an evacuated tube uh, function. Uh, I call it an interval function because you can use it on flat plates as well if that sensor is in the wrong spot. Uh, but basically what you're going to do here is program in an on off time for the, for the solar pump just to come on. So it's independent of the actual sensors in the tanks and then the collectors. Uh, what we do is we program an on time. So we wanna make sure obviously it's during the solar period. So, you know, whenever the, the sun hits the collectors from whatever that time is, that's when the, the start time should be. And when the collectors basically have uh, the energy is off the collectors is at the end time. So anywhere in between this period, the pump is going to run so you can set a time for that pump to run. So in this case, it's 30 seconds. And it's gonna run for every 30 minutes, it's gonna run for 30 seconds. So off for 30 minutes, on for 30 seconds, off for 30 minutes, on for 30 seconds. The idea is that pump is, is cycling the fluid around the system across that sensor that's somewhere in the piping. And if the sensor picks up that that temperature is usable, it's higher than the tank temperature, that pump will continue to operate. So it basically puts it into that on function uh, when that sensor is in a very poor location. So I've used this uh, in multiple um, applications with uh, flat plate collectors uh, because of the fact that those sensors are in, the, in a poor location. So some other uh, functions that we can use in our controls uh, to basically help offset, you know, excess energy or to add energy to the system. The first one on the left-hand side, backup heat control, uh, basically AHO. Uh, what's going to do if you set this is if the tank here, we see in the picture, drops, the sensor picking up the temperatures right here, if that tank temperature drops below 105 Fahrenheit, we're going to turn this pump on. And of course, the fossil fuel boiler is going to be able to heat that back up to that whatever temperature we set it off at. So we were basically on and on off range there uh, where we would cycle this pump just to reheat that tank. So it's essentially a backup to the solar to keep that into a usable temperature. Uh, we also have the reverse of that. What we could also do, uh, and this is a nice one we use in some of those kind of uh, really low solar fraction uh, backup heating systems uh, for low temperature heating uh, spacing applications. What we can do is uh, an after heat function instead of uh, um, the uh, backup heat control uh, function. In this case, what happens is we turn this pump on if the tank temperature up here, the sensor picks up is above whatever the setting is. So we can set up a temperature uh, and if there's more heat than we need for domestic hot water in this tank, for instance, we can turn this pump on and we could dump that heat into our heating system for those shoulder seasons that we're, you know, we're trying to, you know, utilize a bit of, of uh, that uh, auxiliary heat there. And what that allows us to do basically is very simply without a whole lot of extra cost and, and uh, uh, to the system add a little bit of fraction there, we're using that, that energy. You can also think of this as a, you know, maybe there's a standby tank here. And what we're doing is any extra heat that we have, uh, we're dumping into another tank here to, to effectively add more storage to the system as well. So just a bunch of different functions here. Uh, you have these little, we call them little thermostatic functions where a sensor picks up and basically what we do is instead of comparing two sensors, we, we take one sensor, once it reaches a maximum, we, we turn on a pump and then we drop that temperature or raise the temperature here as we as we see in these applications. So you can think about a lot of different ways you can use that in your systems. Uh, so once we get the uh, the um, 
system up and running here, there is some desire sometimes to say, well, what are we getting out of it? I mean, that's, that's something that's that, uh, you know, we want to trend to see just how effective this solar thermal system is, what it's giving us as far as energy. And um, a lot of your controls will have these uh, simple uh, kind of uh, heat metering options that you can turn on as well. You would need a, a third sensor. So generally speaking, how these things work is you've got a sensor in the collector, that's S1. You would also install a, a sensor on the return, and then you're going to program into the control based on what you see here on your flow indicator, the flow rate. You're going to tell the control what type of heat medium you've got. So if it's just water, uh, if you're using a Typha core, there's, because it's a Wiesman control, we use Typha core, there's a, an option for that as well, or whatever type of glycol you're using. The percentage of, of uh, glycol, that's for heat transfer, um, you know, between uh, water and, and glycol, there's a, there's a difference there between the amount of heat transfer we're going to get out of it, so we give it a percentage there. And then it's going to spit out, as that pump runs, the kilowatt hours, eventually megawatt hours of, of solar contribution. So it basically sits in the control and you go to the control and you can kind of read that particular information. So that's always nice to have and it's very simple. It just lets you know that that system is in operation. For more kind of complex, uh, you know, um, remote reading, there are, you know, your control should be able to connect to the outside world, uh, whether it's through a, um, just a, a gateway. So there's a, Raysol has a, a website where you can actually VBUS where you can actually see all that trending remotely, uh, or you can take your controls, hook up to a gateway in some applications. And now if you're using BACnet or Modbus, you'll be able to basically integrate your solar control into your system there. And you can watch all of those uh, bits of information. Um, or even simply on some of the controls, you can just put an SD card in um, and get some uh, log some uh, data there and then basically pull that SD card out and get some idea of the trending. So what we're looking at here basically is just really useful information let you know your system's working. As you can see the, the load temperature here and you see the solar collector temperature and you can see how the two kind of track each other. So as, a, as we get energy, the, the, the temperature in the tank here increases. If we were looking at this and this tank temperature never really changed, but this thing was spiking, it would give us some information, tell us that there's some issue there, we should go to site and have a look at that. So the quicker we, we identify a problem and basically address it, the better and more longstanding that system's gonna be in operation. So it's important to have some indication once you have the system installed, that that thing is actually out there and is actually working. So trending is one of those things that I advocate for sure. And of course, the longer the trends, you can start seeing, you know, basically some normal operation and well, what's going on over here, right? Why did this happen? What event occurred here? Did a pump fail? Uh, did something happen there that that's, you know, we have a power outage, did something happen there that that uh, system uh, kind of went, uh, went nuclear on us, um, you know, at the end of August. So those are kind of the things we look at in the controls and of course the programming of those and uh, you know, those, those, um, you know, the inputs that we need, the sensor inputs, the uh, relay outputs to control the valves and the circulators that are gonna add those systems. Those all have to be figured out. And of course you select that control based on that particular information. And then you're going to, uh, once you have all that stuff, you're gonna program uh, the system into that particular control. So that's about matching what the control shows you with what you have actually standing in front of you or you're staring at there as far as a system. So. Some simple controls have very, you know, very few arrangements you can you can adjust. Other ones are going to have many more different arrangements. You know, more sensor inputs, as I mentioned, more relay outputs uh, to match those more uh, complex systems. But let's start off with systems that really aren't great applications. Um, and the main reason for these uh, two is there's no actual dedicated solar storage in these applications. The solar side of it is all appropriately done. You've charged the system up, you've got your flow rates, you pressurize everything, you size that external heat exchanger appropriately. But that gas fire water heater just finished firing up and that tank is now sitting at 140 Fahrenheit. Uh, so what kind of energy is the solar gonna be able to contribute to that system when that tank is that hot? The best you could do in those types of systems is lower that gas fire water heater uh, set point down and then let the solar uh, top that up. Uh, then you would have some, may, might have some issues there with um, the temperature not being high enough uh, if we drop it down too low. So it'd be some fine tuning there, uh, but you also have to think about, say if I set that tank to 122 Fahrenheit or 50 C and it's holding that tank at one, uh, 120, 
uh, the collectors now have to get that much higher in temperature, which means we're going to lose some efficiency now in trying to dump that much more energy into that tank to top off that 120 Fahrenheit set point. So even though you've done all the right stuff on the solar side, it's the dimensioning on the on the um, storage side that's a problem with these systems that would lead to long-term issues with uh, stagnation in those those types of uh, systems more often than not. Now on the right-hand side, <clears throat> you know you see that you've got some storage down the bottom here, but there is potential when we turn this pump on that we start mixing the tank temperature up here. And of course, if we raise the bottom tank temperature, we're gonna drop the, the top of the tank temperature here to get more, uh, more of an average. If this sensor picks up basically that we need to turn this element on to heat this tank back up, now we're gonna have the solar competing against the electric element here now to charge that particular tank up. Uh, so it, depending on the type of tank you have here, if, it, if it's going to do that, we may have a problem with competing type of technologies here trying to charge that tank up. And it's basically the race to the end here as to which one's going to win. Uh, so again, important that we have a proper amount of storage here for whatever amount of collectors we have remembering the dimensioning and of course if you look at the solar controls we're looking at a fairly simple system we're looking for one pump output we got a sensor at the top we got a sensor inside of the tank here uh, <clears throat> and this one here shows a tank possibly a tank sensor at the top and maybe that heat quantity uh, sensor here sensor four if we're doing some sort of uh, you know calculation of the kilowatt contribution of the system but minimum what we need is two sensors top uh, for the collector uh, bottom for the tank and of course the output there for the uh, pump output now this one here done uh, correctly uh, we've got one pump operation we heat the tank up, it stratifies. We get to a usable temperature at the top of this tank now because uh, of the basically the stratification of the tank. And when somebody opens up a fixture here, we dump energy into our standby, whether it's a direct fired electric water or direct fired gas fire water heater or oil, whatever it might be. We dump directly into that. This valve here is off, right? So we're basically diverting the cold water directly into the solar pre-tank now. So whatever amount of energy we can get out of the solar gets dumped into our existing tank here. So if this tank was a drop in temperature, there is nothing that's gonna move fluid from this side over to this side, the, the, the fossil fuel will kick back in to reheat this tank up, potentially. So the other option would be commercial. So a commercial application, again, this system looking like we have, now we have multiple tanks, maybe one tank we couldn't get was, was large enough or there's some other reason why you bought the slightly smaller tanks than what you actually needed for volume here. But you put them in basically as a battery of, of uh, you know, multiple tanks. And when the solar control comes on here with system one, we just heat all three tanks up simultaneously. So basically each tank will get to a usable basically temperature at the top. When we basically draw uh, heat out of the standby tank here, we dump preheated water into, the, uh, into our uh, standby tank. And again, this, this uh, valve here is off. So all of the cold water goes into these tanks to be heated up by the solar first before we dump it into our standby tank. So that's one way of doing it. So basically you think about that, the collectors are on, we got to heat up a large capacity, three of these tanks up simultaneously. You could also do uh, some more sophisticated systems or more engineering involved in systems five, six, and nine here. So systems five and six are the same, other than the fact we're using diverting valves instead of circulators uh, for sequential tank heating, which means that we heat one tank up first. Once that gets to temperature, we heat a second tank up. Once it gets to temperature, we heat a third tank up. And then of course the control keeps looking back to whichever tank is the coldest and it's gonna reheat that first tank back up again uh, if, it, if it dropped in temperature. So it kind of looks at priority as far as how it loads these tanks and will ensure that that first tank is always uh, the hottest of the, of the three uh, if there's uh, basically, if it drops in temperature. Now, when you do that, that's sophisticated enough that we've added pumps here to basically make sure that these tanks are all being heated individually. But also on the draw side here, we have to make sure that we calculate or engineer uh, we don't want these cold tanks dumping into the uh, into that tank, uh, even though this one here is going to be hot. So we basically have one valve open and two valves closed on these two tanks if this tank here is up to temperature. So you have to think about flow rates of that fluid moving through one tank versus all three. So there's some engineering that has to be uh, involved there uh, to make sure that that system is going to be successful. So the more sophisticated your systems, obviously, 
the more you got to think about how those, you know, the uh, reaction to every, you know, uh, er, reaction every uh, equal to every uh, action that we we do in our system to make sure it's going to perform correctly. And of course, on system nine, it's an east-west setup, so we're still doing sequential loading. Uh, but we have here is, um, you know, we heat up the the tanks in the morning with the east collectors uh, and the evening on the west collectors, at least here in nor North America. So that's the uh, way it goes uh, on those uh, systems. They could be basically just like a single tank with a battery like that, or you can basically break them up uh, in uh, different types of sequential loading capabilities. Uh, another common system we see uh, would be external heat exchangers like this in domestic hot water applications. So we've got the system all programmed here uh, and we would have to add, obviously, uh, with a single array, a single system like this, we'd have to add a parallel relay output uh, for this second uh, pump here, our potable pump, obviously a stainless steel or bronze pump in this, on this side of the heat exchanger uh, because it's going to be pulling potable fluid and dumping into our standby tank here. Once it gets heated up uh, with external heat exchanger, and of course the cold water uh, dumps into our standby tank, uh, gas fire or oil fire water heater, whatever it might be on that side. So again, the similar type of setup, we just have to be aware that we've got a second pump out here that we need to control in that particular application. And commercially, so kind of going back residential commercial. So the, the, the difference is scale, obviously. Uh, you might have more collectors, bigger storage, bigger heat exchangers, bigger pumps in this case. But again, the same type of arrangement here that we're going to look at. Uh, there also might be uh, functions where you see in this application, you may be this line set here is long and the collector, you know, the, a lot of exposed piping to the outside here. So maybe the glycol temperature here is quite cool in the wintertime. And we add a third sensor down here. So you see that we got a sensor in the collector and a sensor in the tank. We still have a delta T function here where uh, we're going to turn on our solar pump when the tank temperature is lower than the collector temperature by a fixed amount of differential, as we just discussed. But we don't turn this pump on yet down here. We use this sensor down at the bottom. Uh, and so once this pump turns on and we start basically pumping that heat around, we're gonna charge up the solar line first. Uh, once we get to a particular temperature here in the line set, now we can turn this pump on and basically exchange heat with the uh, tank here uh, in that domestic hot water system. So the whole idea there is that we don't reverse the energy flow uh, from the tank side to the solar side, but we maintain that we're, the direction of heat flow is always going to go into the tank versus the op opposite direction. So again, that would be based on, you know, how much exposed piping you have outside, you know, the length of piping uh, between the uh, collector array and that, that uh, heat exchange that we've got down uh, in, the, uh, in the system down there. Uh, we also can do uh, tankless water heaters, so just a myriad of Domestic hot water, I mean, it's one of the most popular applications is heating domestic with solar. So of course, lots of different arrangements for that uh, function. And uh, a tankless water heater, sometimes uh, they have a particular entering water temperature that they would need to maintain. So always usually gonna have some sort of mixing valve here to make sure that we maintain a specific temperature going into that water heater so that it can heat up to a limit. Uh, you might want to check with your manufacturer of your, uh, with your tankless water heater here to, to see if there's any sp special arrangements that they have for solar integration. Uh, but you have here basically two uh, normally open uh, valves and a normally closed valve. And what you can do in this instance is in the summertime, you shut off the tankless water heater, you open up your bypass here, and now you're using everything out of the solar directly uh, when those really good solar uh, summer months. So it gives you some options there, uh, basically to bypass so you don't have any problems with this water heater with really high temperature moving through it uh, there in the summertime in particular. And uh, I showed you this uh, little uh, schematic, a little bit different looking uh, last week, but it's just a solar preheat application with an added system pump. So you see uh, this little pump in between, we got our solar system here with our pump, we're dumping energy into our solar tank. When this tank here uh, gets energy, gets uh, draw, of course, we, we start dumping heat from the solar tank into the domestic hot water and all is good. But what happens if there's basically this research pump is turning is on, uh, but there's no load. So nobody's drawing heat, but the research pumps on, which is not very efficient, but that happens. 
this tank a drop in temperature and of course the boiler is going to kick in and reheat that recirculated water back up again even though this tank might be getting up the temperature and we could actually use that heat uh, to heat that tank back up again and keep the boiler off well with this second pump remember that after heat function we looked at here uh, in system two what we could do is say if this tank temperature up here is at a certain level we turn this pump on and now we basically dump heat into that domestic hot water tank uh, and now we're going to equalize the two tank temperatures, which means that we can also have uh, maybe turn this pump back on again and dump more energy into the solar tank. So it just adds a little bit, a, a smaller amount of volume uh, for us to basically um, uh, of energy for the solar to dump energy into here. Uh, but we can also keep the fossil fuel boiler off by utilizing that little pump uh, there as well. Also, uh, other things like uh, pasteurization functions. Uh, you could turn that pump on, we reach 140 or whatever in the solar tank, we turn that on and basically kill any bacteria in both of these tanks uh, whenever that occurs. So some things that you gotta think outside the box a little bit, you'd be able to uh, kind of implement when you have these systems in, in operation. So that's a real good uh, application, that, that last one. Uh, we're getting into more design systems. So these are uh, bivalent tanks or dual coil tanks that we have available. Uh, and uh, you can utilize these. Usually these are engineered uh, when we're engineering the whole heating system. So that bivalent tank you see in front of you there, that, uh, that tank uh, basically, 50% of that tank has been sized uh, to essentially for the total load of the building. So if the boiler is firing heat in the tank up and there's no solar available, there's still enough energy capability in this area of the tank to completely satisfy whatever load the occupants are putting on that domestic hot water system. So it's important that you understand that that's, this is engineered still to, to make sure that we cover off the actual domestic hot water load. Then the bottom of the tank here is sized to make sure that we uh, accommodate the dimensioning of the collectors up on the roof. And the, uh, the benefit of this system here is that directly we can heat the whole tank with solar, whereas the, as long as the domestic hot water research pump is, is piped correctly, as you see here, the boiler can only heat the top portion. Solar can, with stratification, can heat, heat that whole tank. So really good solar days, we keep that boiler off and we heat that whole tank up. And of course that gives us double the amount of volume typically for the solar to heat up. So it makes a really efficient uh, domestic hot water system in these applications. And commercially, this is one of my favorite systems as well for domestic hot water is using those dual coil tanks uh, and basically piping them in parallel. So you size your domestic hot water to basically the 50% of the top of the tank is you know, all, you know, how many tanks do we need to basically cover off that to keep the demand of the whole building for domestic hot water uh, satisfied. Uh, but what that gives us is the bottom of the tanks there now for the solar and that solar can heat up now a massive amount of energy uh, because now it's working at multiple tanks uh, heating up the bottom here. And what you see a lot of times is really efficient um, operation of your systems because in uh, commercial systems, a lot of times you, the draw is enough that the bottoms of the tanks are kept at the entering water temperature. So this pump almost never shuts off. It's just running. Uh, the tank temperature is below what the collectors are giving it during the day. And that pump is just dumping energy continuously into that system, keeping it uh, basically the collectors uh, cooler in temperature, higher in efficiency. And of course, the more we dump in here, the less this boiler has to work. And of course, the more, uh, the better your fuel bills are going to be. So I really like this particular system um, as far as the, using the two coal tanks uh, in operation like that. Uh, in a pool, so kind of moving to the pool heating systems here. Uh, now we're getting into kind of like the dual function or, or multi-load types of, of applications where you've got, you know, uh, you know, two loads. So now multiple sem sensors that you're looking at here. And you can see the proper application is the pool water flows through. We have a sensor picking up the pool temperature. And of course we got our solar uh, collector temperature up here. We got a differential, just like we talked about when we were looking at domestic hot water sizing, a differential between these two. And we're gonna turn this pool pump, uh, basically the this, this solar pump on to heat the heat exchanger up here and get some energy dumped into this little pool on the side. So the arrangements might look a little odd. So this is the arrangement you would look at for this type of application. Just think of this as a pool instead of a tank. Just the heat exchanger is all we're doing and we're dumping into a volume of, of fluid, which is uh, chlorinated, usually pool water at this particular uh, application here. Uh, 
some benefits you have here obviously is uh, you've got a larger collector arrays usually with pool heating, which means higher domestic hot water solar fractions in the winter when the pool may not be uh, using as much heat or using any heat at all, depends on uh, how, how you close your pool down. Um, it also compares uh, temperatures continuously between the two loads and whatever one it can dump energy to, it's going to do that. So it keeps the collectors obviously cooler and more efficient. Uh, but you can also assign priorities, which means that we can basically have the domestic hot water as our priority. We heat that up first. Once it's satisfied, then of course the solar concentration on heating the pool, but it still checks back from time to time on the domestic and says, can I still heat this tank up? Has it dropped the temperature enough that I can now switch back to heating the, the domestic hot water up? So you have that type of, of capability too. So it just depends on the different controls that you're, that you're utilizing um, and you can assign different priorities. If the pool is more important to you than the domestic, uh, then of course you can have the pool heating and then of course back up on the domestic hot water side. If we're heating it uh, as a supplement, so we have a boiler heat exchanger uh, to the pool as well. This is a recommended uh, piping arrangement for those types of applications. And you can see the solar side, really nothing's changed here. I had to squeeze the piping a little bit here to make it, uh, make it work. Uh, but you'll see as the pool water comes into the first heat exchanger, we got our sensor going to our collector here, or to our solar control and the fluid moves through. And then of course, uh, it comes back out. Now the uh, pool controller to the boiler sensor picks up. If that temperature is still too low, the boiler turns on. And then of course we heat this heat exchanger up to top up that energy going up to the pool. So basically it allows the, whatever the pool, whatever the solar can give that pool it gets, and then the boiler will top it up at that point. So a nice arrangement there uh, for your heat exchangers on that side. Uh, for space heating systems, uh, just kind of reviewing the spacing systems here. Uh, this was that little after heat function we talked about um, a little bit earlier. Uh, we use the top portion of a coil here. And in shoulder seasons, think kind of like the, the early fall and late spring uh, times when you, know, you might have a little bit of chill in the air, you need a little bit, little bit of heat. Uh, your collectors might be able to give you that amount of energy. Uh, we just pipe that top coil now because we can actually make it part of the hydronic system for the, for the boiler, closed loop, uh, and add a pump here. And now if the tank temperature here gets us to a usable temperature, we can actually start dumping that energy into the return of our boiler here and keeping that boiler off or substantially uh, adjusting its load requirements so that it doesn't have to work as hard to get to that particular temperature. So it does a real uh, a good job of, of um, you know, cost effective, you know, not, not a, lot, a lot of extra cost here, uh, not a lot of extra room or space in the mechanical room either. We've got just using the coil inside the tank here and uh, we're just basically stealing a little bit of that extra energy uh, from time to time to help assist in heating the building. So a nice little application there for low solar fractions. If you're going full on space heating in your systems, uh, these are the systems that are most potential to overheat in the summer because we are basically designing for more winter, winter biased um, operation. Uh, so we do a few things when we talk about, you know, uh, summer bias versus winter bias. And some of that helps us uh, eliminate extra energy in the summertime. But these are the systems you're most likely gonna be uh, wary of when it comes to things like heat dumps, uh, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, if you, again, just uh, not, a, not to, to beat this to death, but uh, why not uh, make sure the pressure in the collectors is kept, you know, at about 44 pounds in the 200s that keeps them from steam. Uh, use those control strategies that we just talked about, collector cooling functions, nighttime cooling functions. Remember, we're still going to jam this tank here full of energy, this heat spacing tank in the summertime. Uh, let's use that to our advantage. Uh, set the collector to a winter bias. Remember, if we adjust the collectors now for a, a steeper pitch because we want to get more energy in the wintertime, it's going to increase our fraction on those winter months. You see the little purple line here, 60 degrees. But in the summer months, you see we'd lose about 15% of the energy that would have hit the collector surface because of that uh, angle. So right off the bat, that's some heat dissipation uh, for our system uh, so that it's gonna mitigate that overheating uh, problem. So other systems that uh, would recommend a heat dump, uh, think about systems that uh, there are really no summer uh, loads. Uh, so vacation, uh, places where you know you're closed for uh, a lot of the summer months, thinking more on the ski uh, hill type of things. 
uh, intermittent loads for domestic hot water, um, office buildings, schools, those types of things, uh, those could be uh, problematic. You'd want to uh, basically address those as well. Uh, obviously, any oversized systems, how do you know they're oversized? Well, they're probably going to be in practice once they start operating. Uh, and of course, um, if oversized systems, if you do a simulation, so we start off with a simulation, then we'll pick that up right away. And of course, if you're not using the strategies for the 200 FM collectors, of course, heat dumps would be recommended as well. But if we see these types of spikes in your um, simulations, where you got these points where there's no uh, load and you see these big spikes in temperature, we're going to recommend at that point that we add some sort of heat dump onto those systems. So collectors, uh, evacuated tube collector systems, for instance, that are oversized, always having some sort of heat dump on those because the temperatures in those evacuated tube collectors can get to some serious numbers where you got a lot of steam formation in there, uh, which could be, um, uh, quite aggressive. So you want to put a heat dissipation on there. And basically what the heat dump is going to do uh, is once this tank is up to temperature, we can't jam any more heat into it. The collectors are still cooking up there. We're going to turn this pump on. We're going to change the position of the diverting valve. So now the fluid is going to move and get rejected through our fan coil or radiation, whatever that might be, and come back around and essentially keep the collector from getting into those steam back uh, areas. Uh, the whole idea here is to keep and protect the fluids from those extreme uh, temperatures uh, that we're looking at. So a key critis, uh, criteria here is obviously the temperature that your collectors can get to and the, what that um, possible issue could be with your solar fluid. So rounding out the, uh, the conversation here on maintenance. So looking at what we have to do to maintain these systems. So we've got a commission, we got all that information uh, basically documented. We are successful, systems working. Uh, we program that with all the different um, uh, program logics we have and the controls to make the system optimized. Uh, so ongoing, obviously you always wanna make sure that nobody's turned that valve on on the air vent at the top of your system. Uh, one of the most critical areas, if, that, if that's opened up, of course, you're going to have steam and that's going to basically lower the pressure, which would eventually cause some problems in your system. So just make sure that that's closed. Uh, just like any hydronic system, you're looking for leaks, right? So look at the collector system at the roof there. Any areas there where there's leakage, you see any signs or for, you know, any signs or evidence that you've got leaks going on there. Uh, if you've got... Um, you know, any problems in the mechanical room where you see, uh, you know, um, water dripping from the joints or from the connections, uh, those are basically going to drop your pressure and also increase the air in your system, uh, which will be a problem uh, in your system. So basically there's been studies there that show that leaky systems or, or systems with a permanent supply of oxygen, so poorly vented systems, they're going to be much more problematic than even a system that's high that's basically uh, just has no air in it, but you've got a lot of stagnation uh, events because of an oversizing event. So it's very important to get that air out and keep the fluid inside of that system once you get it started. So check for leaks and, and, and address those as quickly as possible. Uh, <clears throat> make sure that the system here is in good operating form. So check the pump. Is it squealing? Is it noisy? Is it working? Is it hot? Over amp draw? All those types of things just to make sure that we have no issues on the pump side. Uh, our flow meter there is working correctly. We got flow when we turn the pump on. Uh, and uh, basically that, you know, the system here is in good operating condition that we can see. So we have, uh, like I say, relays and contacts for manual operation of the pumps on our controls that would be able to do that fairly simply. Uh, once the control is uh, looked at here, you wanna you know, make sure that the control has no alarms on it, right? There's no sensor issues, no problems with that side of it. Uh, make sure the little happy face is on the controls. And uh, all of this, it goes towards the control is faulty. Obviously the system isn't gonna be working. And uh, unless you examine it, you're not gonna have that, that information or knowledge. So just have a look at the control, make sure all its functions are there. Uh, <clears throat> we take a pH test every couple of years typically. Uh, <clears throat> and what we're looking for there is obviously that the pH stays above about seven. Uh, if it drops down below seven, we wanna flush that system. If you got really 
uh, poor glycol. That's like, once you get above like 170 C, so we're talking some pretty aggressive systems here, oversized dimension, you actually get proteins built up and you get these solids kind of in your system. And that's going to require some pretty serious cleaning of that system. But normally what we do, uh, run some hot, heated water through that system to flush it out. Um, if you have those types of things and then top it up with fresh uh, solar glycol. This is less of a problem if you've been looking after the rest of this, this list on an ongoing basis. So just checking all that stuff out, making sure uh, that all of your, your uh, controls and stuff are programmed correctly, uh, basically mitigates these types of issues actually occurring in your system to begin with. And of course you could check the freeze protection uh, using a refractometer or a uh, refractometer. Uh, refract refractor meter sounds a little bit like a you know like a superhero. Right? He has his uh, special power is bending light. So uh, refractor meter man, uh, you can bring him and he can check to see what that uh, freeze protection uh, number is uh, for you out there. Uh, so that's important. With Typhacore, uh, I've added a slide in. I'm not going to show you, but there's a there's a um, basically we can check the specific gravity gravity of the glycol with a little, uh, a simple little test, uh, inexpensive, uh, that will give you the same type of uh, information. Uh, so it's a little accessory that you can buy for Typhacore specifically. Uh, we don't sell these, we do sell the other devices. Uh, bleed air, obviously ongoing, uh, bleeding air from our air vents to make sure that we get the air out of the system. Uh, check referencing back to your little sticker here, what are our pressures on our pressure gauges and make sure all that stuff is looking good. And have we lost any fluid over the year, right? Just measuring to see if there's anything in that little container tells me that relief valve has popped. And, uh, you know, there's something I might have to address here. What happened? Uh, maybe go back to the trending and have a look at see if you can kind of find where, when that particular event happened or occurred, if you've got that capability. So those are the things we would generally have a look at as far as just uh, checks, uh, you know, in your mechanical room and, you know, occasionally up on the roof to see uh, if there's any issues. If you identify those quickly, then of course they become less and less of an issue. Now, depending on your collectors, uh, you can inspect your collector tubes as well. Um, a, a lot of evacuated tube collectors, uh, they seal off the vacuum with a barium uh, getter. Uh, and that getter basically has a, a nice reflective surface or coating that it, that it puts on the glass. And typically it's on the back side of the glass. You can see it. Uh, the picture down here in the bottom right is a collector. You see that milky kind of opaque kind of look to it versus the reflective surface. This is telling me that the barium getter basically is oxidizing. It just tells me that air is getting in there and that the uh, vacuum here is being lost. As long as there is some reflective uh, reflection on that glass still, there's still some getter that's in, that hasn't been oxidized, that collector, that tube is still under a vacuum. But once you lose it all and it becomes cloudy, and of course there's no more vacuum, that tube is going to work okay in the winter or summertime. In the wintertime, it basically does nothing uh, for the system whatsoever. So that's an inspection. And just something to mention here, uh, <clears throat> sometimes you might notice in flat plate collectors, Again, it's varied depending on site, uh, angle of the collectors, all that type of stuff. You might see some uh, condensation inside the glass. And the first thing you would look at and think is, my gosh, my collector's leaking. We've got a problem. But collectors of this type, evacuate or not evacuate to, but uh, flat plate collectors uh, are uh, breathing. They actually have ventilation holes in, in them so that they can actually breathe. So when they're in operation, they actually are expanding. The heat expands inside as the... Um, as the collector gets that radiation hitting the collector, of course, everything is expanding out there and it breathes kind of outwards. When it gets colder at night or the temperature changes, of course, the temperature difference between the collector and the outside air, that might actually suck cooler air in and moist air in. And of course, you've got some of that moisture now deposited in the insulation. So we got insulation in the collectors here and it kind of sits in that insulation. And uh, when the collector heats back up again, so now when the collector gets exposed to radiation uh, and starts to heat up, that um, water is now, that condensation is now going to evaporate and it's going to show uh, as far as what it looks like as far as steam on the surface of the glass. And depending on how long that is, uh, usually about 30 minutes or so that that occurs. And then of course the glass is uh, basically cleared up and now you're back to basically absorbing heat and dumping it into the storage tank or, or whatever you've got there. You could also notice this in systems that are, that are uh, undersized 
where the collector uh, temperature never gets up above a, you know, a specific point because the load that's attached to it is just so great. Uh, you got nice high efficiency, but the collector never gets up to a point where it can actually get enough to evaporate that, that condensate. In those cases, uh, a lot of times there's minimum collector temperature uh, um, functions in a lot of the controls you can use. And basically you, you uh, stop that pump uh, from coming on until the collector gets to a specific temperature, uh, which would basically allow it to evaporate that condensate and get it off the glass uh, so it's usable again. So there's different ways of getting this. The steeper the pitch of the collector, typically the better it uh, ventilates. So that's why we don't like to have the collector sitting flat, you know, at zero degrees. We like to prop them up. And typically we like to see, you know, 20 plus degree angle uh, to allow for good ventilation through the collectors in operation. So to round it off, to finish up here, uh, some of the things that we look at that might go wrong with your systems. We took, we, we've kind of gone through great depths here on this, uh, these three uh, presentations to help you um, size things. So things go right here. Uh, so we, we make the, the right decisions and, and make the right, uh, you know, um, adjustments to the um, project before it gets into operation. So first thing is obviously not starting out with a plan. So the system is too big. Uh, so too many collectors versus how much um, size we have, or we have too small of a uh, system for the size of the collectors that we have up on the roof. Uh, so this might be because of some issue with the sizing, what we, how we size the system. Maybe we oversize the domestic hot water load uh, and we jam too many collectors on the roof there. And that load is much smaller than that actually estimated estimation. So now the volume of that tank isn't changing enough. And of course the tank is too small. Uh, so those are things we, we wanna look at. And that goes right back to last week's uh, presentation about how to properly dimension your collectors and make sure you've got the right amount of uh, volume of fluid in the tank, in the mechanic room to absorb whatever heat's gonna grab or basically get um, uh, uh, be placed on the collectors while they're in operation. So that's one of the things we want to avoid. We want to dimension those things correctly. Uh, not setting the uh, pressure in your expansion tank correctly. Remember, we want to put a little bit of a uh, bladder uh, flex here. We don't want our tank looking like this uh, in operation. We want to actually have about you know three to five pounds lower pressure, pre-charge pressure in the tank so that this tank absorbs a bit of our glycol. The reason why we want to do that is when this uh, system has very like a, a huge amount of temperature difference variations, you could be at a you know 130 C. You could also be down as low as minus 30 C, depending on the area that you're at. So <clears throat> when we're filling up the system, we add a little bit here because of course this is going to basically get reduced when it's really cold. It's going to actually uh, contract the the bladder, and of course as it gets really warm, it's going to increase the volume here a little bit. Uh, so we have that basically what we call a little water seal uh, in the expansion tank to hold that. And then we sized it correctly to make sure that if we get into a steam back formation, as we see here, that our relief valve doesn't pop, all of the fluid sits inside of that expansion tank. So it's pressurized and it's sized correctly for the system. And we reviewed that uh, last week. Uh, Domestic hot water research lines going through the solar uh, preheat tank instead of going through the domestic hot water standby tank. Uh, the reason why that's not good, obviously, is that we're charging this system up to a usable temperature in the domestic tank. What's that temperature we're actually getting out of that? We're not quite sure. This tank here is usually kept at a more you know, standard temperature for operation for the building here. Uh, so typically what we want to see is that uh, moving into the tank side versus this side here. Uh, one exception I would kind of uh, kind of offer to you here would be things like uh, think about uh, like a school uh, application. We have domestic hot water in a school, uh, but in the summertime, that school is of course vacant and there's nobody in the classrooms and there's really not a whole lot of domestic hot water load. What you could do to basically offset any overheating is if you had the ability of adjusting where in the summertime where you isolated the research going into the standby tank and you basically forced the research pump to go into our solar storage tank, we can now dump the heat through the researching of the, uh, going out through the whole uh, school here and basically uh, 
uh, taking that tank back down in temperature so they don't have any issues uh, with overheating in the tank here. So we're basically dissipating heat as it, as it gets created through the recirc line. We could also use that for things like uh, anti, uh, basically any legion errors type of function, pasteurization function. If this tank gets up above 140, we could basically circulate that through the system now to kill any bacteria in the lines and through this tank as well. So just some uh, ability there, uh, taking a kind of a disadvantage into an advantage by looking at those types of applications as well for these types of systems. Uh, no heat rejection. We looked at obviously the, uh, without heat rejection uh, in your systems, uh, we're gonna cook the glycol. And of course that's gonna just make more system problems, more potential for relief valves to pop, uh, more acidic uh, glycols, and basically just more um, attention to that system, which essentially means uh, every time we have to go to that system and do some service on it, it means that it's in a more expensive system as far as its life cycle cost. We want to minimize the amount of, uh, you know, trips to the job site here to service things. And we want this system to basically work automatically. If it needs a heat rejection, we should put the heat rejection in there for that particular purpose. Also oversizing your uh, piping uh, or your flow rates there. Uh, we wanna make sure that we match, again, it's all about dimensioning the number of collectors, the size of the tank, uh, make sure the pumps are sized appropriately to make sure we get the right flow, the right size pipe, the right amount of volume of fluid, all those things. And that can only come if we engineer the system uh, from start to finish there to make sure it's correct. Uh, under or basically selecting the wrong type of collector. There's a lot of basically desire to say, you know, like, you know, those evacuated tubes are just they're you know they divide they defy physics as far as their capabilities of of, uh, of getting heat. They're so much better than a flat plate collector. I'm going to use them in all of my applications. The reality is, uh, for a lot of applications, the flat plate is actually more appropriate for the temperatures you're looking for. And we we talked about this in actually the first week. Uh, of basically sizing, you know, what collector is the best for your application? Uh, starting out with that, you know, is it a flat plate? Is it a plastic collector? Is it an evacuated tube collector? You've got to look at what the temperature application is there and select based on that as far as, and as, as well as, you know, the operating uh, periods of that collector and, and basically select the collector accordingly. Uh, and oftentimes because of just the attractiveness of an evacuated tube, uh, versus a flat plate, they're, they're picked, uh, but then they become more problematic because they're not the right fit for the application. So kind of look at that as well. And we size it up when, we're, when we do our simulations to tell you whether or not the flat plate's the best choice or if you should look for something a little bit different than the flat plate. And then of course, incorrect programming of your control, right? Not utilizing the different functions to basically uh, keep that system in, in good operating condition. Uh, or if you have BMS control here, it's not set up correctly. We're not looking at delta Ts. The sensors are in the wrong location. All those types of things. Uh, if though, if our programming is incorrect, there's just no chance for the system to work uh, accordingly or appropriately. So it could be a problem. Uh, too long of a line set between the collectors and the storage tank, which basically, or you know, poorly insulated lines here which basically means whatever energy we have here just never makes it to the tank. Uh, and of course, there's more problems with air elimination, all those types of things with really longer line sets. Uh, so we try to avoid, you know, try to get the mechanic room and the collectors and, you know, in the, as close as we can uh, to mitigate any issues with, you know, having a uh, extended line, you know, just more cost, more expense and less performance. And finally, basically starting up the system uh, doing all the commissioning that we just did, all the sizing, everything we just did, and not having actually any load at that particular point in time uh, would not be uh, ideal. So I think about it like in a residential application. You don't want to start the system up when there's nobody in the building yet. We want to make sure essentially that there is occupation, that people are doing their daily, uh, you know, routines, and then we can actually have that solar uh, commissioned. Um, same with an office, you know, another commercial building, you know, uh, um, an apartment building, whatever, we don't want to commission a system when they're still, you know, uh, putting drywall up on the walls there just because we're ready to do that. The reason being is by the time the system's actually being utilized, it, we may have already gone through several events of, of stagnation and, and having some issues there. So we want to basically uh, commission a system once we actually have that load that we can uh, utilize. So that's the uh, solar uh, presentation. That was part three of three, uh, about two and a half minutes over. Uh, so my apologies there, but I, 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 I'm, I'm getting a little bit better on my timing there. So I just wanna thank you guys for 
uh, hanging with us here. Um, and uh, I guess we can open it up uh, to uh, Steve if we have any questions. Mark, uh, any questions that anybody have? Steve, Steve looked after it just wonderfully. Nice, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> nice job. And, so and thanks. It's good yeah. on the time, buddy. That's the closest you've ever been to re right on time. See, I feel good, man. I just, I'm, uh, you can't see me, but I'm actually pat myself on the back. Yeah, that feels good. So that last little note. So thank you guys so much. But, you know, how can we as Wiesman assist you with your projects? You know, there's some of the things we talked about there. We have uh, um, a solar checklist we can send you that you can, uh, you know, fill out. And the whole idea is to get some talking points there, get the conversation going as far as the solar. Uh, if you have people that are interested in that, you can uh, we, be more than happy to, to do some of those uh, simulations for you, uh, give you some ballparks as far as what the budget cost would be for those systems. And I kind of hope that I convinced you over the last three weeks, if you've taken in all three, that we're, we're, uh, we know what we're kind of doing here as far as solar and uh, you're in you're in good hands. And like I say, the one of the reasons why Steve joined us here today is just to kind of show you we we we've got uh, we've got a pretty good uh, group of people here on this side of it uh, to assist you in these projects as you move forward. And also, Steve was the author of the Solar Design Guide. So a lot of the stuff information that I reviewed here was directly uh, based on basically pouched. You know, I kind of uh, stole all that stuff from his. Uh, hard work and diligence in putting that uh, that uh, document together uh, for you guys uh, to use out there in the field. So that's uh, basically it for me as far as that that side of it. Um, so if we're good to go, you guys have anything to say? No, I'm good. All right, Steve. I'm good. Thank you, man, for joining us, Steve. Special guest, and yeah, thanks, as Steve. always, Mark. Mark, thank you for uh, for always uh, you know tuning in there, and you didn't have to be the referee today. No, nope. uh, maybe we'll, maybe when we sign off here, we'll get into a discussion. But uh, yeah. I think... <laughs> all right, thanks very much, okay. and uh, until later. next time, take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye.